Hello, welcome to your refresher course on the basics of safety management systems. I am Jan Peters, your instructor for this course. I will visit your company next week for your three-day advanced SMS course. I thought it would be useful, however, for you to have this online refresher course to review the basic concepts of SMS. Don't worry, it's not going to be very theoretical. It's meant as a quick overview for operational managers. This online course has three main sections that describe safety management systems. Section number one, we will describe why we need an SMS. Section number two will describe how an SMS works. And in section number three, we discuss the many elements that make up a successful SMS. In the three-day advanced course in your company, we will discuss much more in detail how SMS works and how it contributes to your safety performance. I hope this course is useful for you. Let's begin. When we look at the beginning of the modern jet transport age and we think back to the first commercial jet aircraft like the Comet, remember that the ratio of accidents per million flights was quite high. In the 1950s, accidents were mainly caused by technological factors. Remember the square windows on the Comet? So in order to bring the accident rate down, there was a heavy emphasis on accident investigation which determined technical factors that caused the accident. Once we found out what caused the accident, we fixed the design or maintenance practices. Typically, the way aviation industry got better was to capture these hard-won lessons in aviation regulations. You could say that regulations are written in blood because fundamentally they are derived from the lessons learned from fatal accidents. Once aviation technology got more mature, we're talking now about the 1970s and aircraft like the 747, we saw that the nature of accident causation changed. A typical example was that of the Tenerife accident, where two perfectly functional aircraft collided because of problems of coordination of perception of humans. The result was that in the industry we started paying attention to human factors or the individual's performance to keep our aircraft safe. For flight crew, crew resource management was invented and engineers started to be trained in human error management. This focus on human factors brought down the accident rate quite significantly. However, improvements started to slow down. In the 1990s, we started looking differently at accidents. Instead of looking at the individual as a cause of accidents, we started looking at the complex system in which the individual works. This is based on the organizational accident causation model by James Reason. Although over time we shifted focus between different areas, we can't assume that the previous areas are fixed. We are still dealing with technological factors that contribute to safety events. Take for instance the 787 and its battery fire incidents. Human error in human factors are still relevant as well as our organizational factors. So modern safety management has to encapsulate all of the above to ensure that we keep improving our accident rate. The model developed by James Reason helps to analyze how accidents in organizations happen. The model reflects that we have different defenses in our organization at different levels. When something goes wrong, it is usually not only caused by one person doing something wrong. Our system should have defenses against that. But if these defenses are weak, like the holes in the Swiss cheese, it is more likely that an unsafe act could lead to an accident. Although the Swiss cheese model has limitations, it helped us look at accidents in a different way. By analyzing and fixing the contributing factors in the organizations, the holes in the cheese, we have many more opportunities to make our system better and reduce the likelihood of an accident. So, when we now try to define what safety is, we start to realize that it is almost impossible to avoid every accident. Plugging all of the holes in our defenses is very, very expensive and would cost so many resources that we can't operate. In other words, if you want to be completely safe, you would have to lock up your aircraft in the hangar and never fly again. Obviously, this is not an option. An airline organization doesn't exist to never have an accident. It exists to 
transport people from point A to point B. Of course, the way we need to do that is to be reliable and safe, so that our passengers, shareholders and aviation authorities have confidence in us, which allows us to remain in business because the passengers keep buying tickets. So a more practical way to define safety is that we reduce the likelihood of an accident to an acceptable level. Not zero, but so low that we are willing to take the risk to fly. This is how ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, has defined safety. It is the state where the possibility of harm to persons or of property damage is reduced to and maintained at or below an acceptable level. The way ICAO says we need to achieve that is through a continuing process of hazard identification and safety risk management. So now we have to define what a hazard is, given that we need to identify it. A hazard is something, for example an object, property or a substance, or a phenomenon or an activity that can cause adverse effects. For instance, fuel is a hazard if it's not controlled, because it can burn and its fumes can explode. So a situation like a fuel leak is a situation which has the potential to cause harm or damage. A hazard is something to be risk assessed. So now we can define what is risk. From the definition of safety we have the definition of risk. Risk is the possibility that harm or damage can happen. There are two dimensions of risk. First of all, the likelihood that something bad can happen. And second of all, the severity. If something bad happens, how bad will it be? So this is where the risk formula comes from. Likelihood times severity. It has a big impact on the way we manage safety because now it does not only depend on what our performance was in the past, but how likely is it that we will have an accident in the future. A particular property of risk is that in part it depends on the perception of what is likely. If people think that it is likely that we will have an accident, it will affect our ability to do business. Nobody will buy tickets anymore. So we have to demonstrate that we have done everything possible to reduce the likelihood of an accident happening. In our SMS, we also call risk safety risk to distinguish it from other types of risk such as financial, health and environmental. When we talk about safety risk, we mean the risk of an aviation accident happening. The management dilemma of running an aviation organization is to decide how much resources we need to dedicate to protecting ourselves from an accident. The protection as equals the layers of Swiss cheese in our organizational accident model. Each of these layers costs resources, time, money, assets or effort. The other dimension is our level of resources dedicated to production. The more resources we dedicate to production, the more we will produce, of course, making us more money. However, it is clear that both extremes are bad. On one hand, say you totally disregard protection and put only resources into production, sooner or later you will have an accident. To illustrate this, this would be a situation where an airline disregards all regulations, doesn't do any maintenance, doesn't respect rest time for the crews, and in general overexploits the organization's assets in an unsustainable manner. The other case is equally bad. Like we said, if we try to eliminate every potential risk, or in other words, overprotect the organization by putting too many, or in other words, overprotect the organization by putting too many layers of cheese in, we would not be able to produce anything. As a result, we will not make any money, and soon the organization will go bankrupt. For instance, this would happen if an organization is extremely risk averse and wants absolute safety. This would mean spending too much money on things like training, maintenance and only fly under the best conditions such as blue skies, no winds and so on. This could very well be an acceptable policy if you are a general aviation aero club and you want to protect your aircraft. But it would be a very expensive aero club. For a commercial airline organization, this level of protection is obviously unsustainable. 
The function of the airline is to reliably and punctually transport passengers from A to B even if there are hazardous conditions. So the aviation organization has to find a happy medium. What typically happens in a reactive safety management system is that it starts at a certain level of safety protection. But over time this level of protection starts to go down. As a result of less attention to protection, a serious incident might happen. Typically, after such an incident, everybody in the organization is scared of an accident and everybody pays more attention to protecting the operation. So the level of safety goes up again. However, what happens after a while is people forget again and we can have another serious incident. However, usually what happens after a while is that the people in the organization forget about the serious incident. More and more focus goes to the production of the organization, making money. As a result, there might be another serious incident. Now the cycle repeats. When we see that the company is expanding and increases production without improving its protection in equal measure, we start to see that the original level of safety is not enough anymore. Now the decrease in protection at this high level of, of production can suddenly lead to an accident. This constant cycle is called reactive safety management. Action is only taken after a serious incident happens and after a while the organization forgets to be afraid of an accident and relaxes too much. Often it leads to overreactions when something happens and these overreactions cost a lot of time and energy. Because the confidence of the traveling public is affected it might be necessary to dedicate more attention to protection which costs more money than is necessary to guarantee safety. A much better way of managing safety is to measure when safety performance is decreasing and act in to improve protection before incidents happen. Often this is more cost effective because the actions to correct the system are smaller and they are less costly. Now to measure if our organization is nearing bankruptcy because of escalating cost we have a well established system, the financial management system. For safety, we need a safety management system that allows us to measure safety performance and the level of risk or how close we are to an accident and the capability to reduce risk to an acceptable level. From the organizational accident model, we can see that unsafe acts play a role in accident causation. We need to understand why these unsafe acts happen to our people. This is the study of human factors. Human factors studies how the environment of the organization influences human performance. By understanding and improving the contributing factors that can provoke errors and violations, we can improve our system and reduce risk. From the previous lectures, we can now see that we need a tool to measure our safety performance. This tool should allow us to manage safety in a proactive manner to reduce the likelihood of an accident to an acceptable level. This system needs to look at the technical, human and organizational factors that can cause accidents and improve risk controls that defend the system against those accidents. These risk, con these risk controls cost resources and our organization can only dedicate so much resources to protection. So another very important function of the system to manage safety is to prioritize which risks need to be addressed first. In short, we can sum up the purpose of the SMS as a tool to allocate resources to reduce risk. So to see if our safety management system is doing that, we can ask four simple questions. First question is, what is most likely to cause your next accident or incident? This question is another way of asking, do you know what the most important risks in your operation are? It gets interesting when you ask this question at different levels of the organization. If people answer this question very differently, it is an indication that the organization as a whole is not clear about which risks are the most important. The second question is, how do you know about your risk? This evaluates how well your SMS is functioning, what kind of hazard data and investigation capability is available to identify risk in the organization. The third question is, what are you doing about these risks? It is obvious that just knowing what the highest risks are is not going to make your organization safe. We have to take action to reduce these risks 
through investing time, money and effort in risk controls that bring risk to an acceptable level. The fourth question is about assuring that your organization is safe. Asking, are your risk controls still working? The organization might have invested in risk controls in the past, but over time, like we saw in the previous lecture, the, the effectiveness of these controls might degrade. Think about the red descending curve in the safety space. If people stop paying much attention to following rules and procedures, our likelihood of having an accident might increase. So not only do we have to take action to reduce risk, we have to verify that these actions work. This is the purpose of having safety management systems. This is the purpose of having safety management systems. In the next sections, we will discuss the various elements that we have to put in place to answer these four questions successfully. So section two is a rather brief bridge to explain how an SMS works. We describe an SMS, then we go into risk-based decision-making and make a simple model of safety risk management. So based on the previous section we can describe what the safety management system should look like. First of all, it should be a systematic and proactive approach to managing safety. As we saw from the history of safety management, a reactive approach which is not systematic is both costly and ineffective. In order to work, the SMS has to have organizational structures, accountabilities, policies and procedures, which we will describe in section number three. You will also see from the accident causation model that factors which contribute to an accident are present at different levels of the organization. So the SMS needs to be an integrated approach, not only covering flight operations. To achieve high levels of safety performance, it needs to look at the maintenance and engineering functions, cabin safety, ground operations, training and even commercial planning and finance, which all play a role in safety management. Make sure that the organization takes appropriate action when risk is identified. The SMS needs to be an explicit element of the corporate management responsibility. This means that it needs to be properly documented and described in the company's safety policy which defines how it intends to manage safety as an integral part of its overall business. Why is risk-based decision-making so important? If we did not base our safety-relevant decisions on risk, the problem might be that our limited protection resources are allocated to the wrong problem. As a result, the likelihood of having an accident is not reduced. This can create a false sense of security. We might think we are safe because we do many actions, but if we don't have an accurate view of risk, we have no idea if they are actually working. So through the SMS operation, our management team can make confident and informed decisions to reduce risk. A good SMS will also allow us to become proactive. Not only is this cheaper, but it is also a lot easier, because as a result of proactive safety management, there will be less serious incidents. So, as a result, there will be less crisis and firefighting. Because the safety recommendations are based on good investigations, the actions to reduce will have a better chance of working. The way an SMS typically operates is described in this simple model. First of all, the SMS is a data gathering tool about risk in the operation. Risk is generated by hazards, which can cause harm or damage if the risk control doesn't work. The biggest source of hazard identification comes from staff reports. There are a few conditions, however, that need to be fulfilled before we start to get useful reports from staff members. First of all, they need to know what to report. This is a matter of safety training. Second of all, they need to feel comfortable reporting, meaning that they are not worried that something bad will happen to them if they admit to an unsafe act. It is important that we get information to have a chance to improve the operation. This is why we introduced the concept of just culture. Third of all, it's very important that staff believe that reporting is useful. In other words, that the operation will improve when they highlight a problem. The way to do this is good feedback information to the people who make the reports. This is a safety promotion function. There are many other sources of safety data such as flight data monitoring, safety audits and so on which we'll cover in the advanced course. The second big step in SMS then is risk assessment. 
On the basis of safety data about hazards, we will try to identify what the biggest causes of risk are in our operation. This is very important, to prioritize where the SMS needs to dedicate its investigation resources. If we investigate too many things at once, we will not have a good quality of investigation and have less chance of identifying effective interventions. After we identified the highest priority issues, we will start to investigate. The purpose of the investigation is to identify effective risk controls. Either identify how to improve existing risk controls or if new risk controls need to be implemented. The result of this investigation is actionable safety intelligence, consisting of safety recommendations. This is where our risk-based decision-making process starts. The role of our safety department is to perform the first three steps. But it is the management team which needs to decide, based on risk information, where to allocate resources. Note that the safety manager cannot decide anything. He needs to effectively collaborate with the management team to have a smooth and effective risk-based decision-making process. Once it is decided where to improve or add controls, the responsible person of the management team needs to be in charge of implementing action. This is very important. It is only the manager of the respective department who can effectively implement actions that improve the operation. Once the action is implemented, it is up to the quality management system to verify the presence of these new risk controls and through measuring safety performance indicators, we verify that the risk controls are effective. Safety management is a core business function that must be considered at the same level and with the same importance as other business functions. It is delivered through a dedicated management system. An SMS is systematic, proactive and explicit. This first pillar is really there to create an infrastructure for the safety risk management, safety assurance and safety promotion functions to work. It supports the other three functions. It defines the philosophy of the organization towards its safety management, which is captured in the safety policy. It describes who is accountable for safety, the key personnel functions of the SMS, planning, coordination of the emergency response plan, and how SMS should be documented. The first step of any successful project is to get support from the senior management. It is essential that the safety management is seen as an integral strategic aspect of the business. With this in mind, there has to be a visible board level commitment to an effective SMS. The accountable manager with the senior management team sets the standard for the organization's safety culture. Without this commitment, an SMS will be ineffective. The safety policy is a document where the support for SMS is made visible to everybody in the organization. To protect the reporting culture, the safety policy must include the safety reporting procedures and clearly tell everyone that the staff will not be punished for reporting safety related information, even if they admit their own mistakes or errors. On the other hand, it should also clearly indicate which types of behaviors are unacceptable, such as negligent behavior or sabotage. It is through a clear statement from the most senior management that the necessary human and financial resources will be assigned to the safety risk management. It should be made clear that the senior management expects all managers and staff to follow the safety management philosophy in their day-to-day -day jobs. It is the management team that is responsible to control safety risks by setting organizational priorities, defining procedures, hiring, training and most of all supervising employees, buying equipment, using the skills of the people in the organization and assigning the many resources necessary. The management should also ensure that safety directives and controls are embedded in rules and procedures. Management should ensure that it is clear to everybody that it is expected to follow rules and procedures. In case it is not possible, it should be reported so procedures can be adapted to the operation. Equipment should also be maintained in workable condition. The safety policy ideally should be short, using simple la language and be clear in its intention. Of course a policy is only a piece of paper, 
In fact, it is a promise from the senior manager to the staff. But it will only be credible if the managers of the operation lead by giving a good example and do what the policy said they should do. If staff sees that the management themselves are pushing to break the rules for the sake of punctuality or cost cutting, it will damage the credibility of the safety culture of the organization. The safety policy should re be regularly reviewed to ensure it remains relevant and appropriate to the organization. It should also be written by the management team, not just a generic copy from ICAO because nobody will believe that. The accountable executive has the ultimate responsibility and accountability for the implementation and maintenance of the SMS. Accountability means that you have to explain what you are doing with respect to safety and that you have to show results of what you are doing. You will be held responsible if you fail to do what is expected of you. There should also be defined lines of a safety accountability for the members of senior management team and all the members of management. This means, for instance, that they should have it defined in their job description what their safety responsibilities are. These responsibilities should be communicated throughout the organization. It is very important that we define the management level who has the authority to make decisions regarding to safety risk tolerability. The safety review board is a high level committee which considers strategic safety functions and is applicable to large organizations. The board should be chaired by the accountable manager and should normally include directors and senior management of the organization. The safety action group reports to and takes strategic direction direction from the safety review board. This comprises managers, supervisors and staff from operational areas. The safety manager may also be included in this safety action group. There might be different safety action groups per department. The safety manager's role is to be an independent advisor on safety matters to the accountable manager. In many respects he is like your doctor. He performs a role of measuring the safety health of your organization and advises the management team the best way to get healthier and be able to perform better. It is important that he or she has direct access to the accountable manager because the safety manager should not be influenced by production issues. His only concern is the protection of the organization. It is up to the accountable manager and his team to make an informed decision on the basis of the advice of the safety manager and the SMS. The safety manager is responsible to manage the SMS implementation and the operation. It is his tool to diagnose the safety health of the organization. As part of this SMS operation, the safety manager will perform with his team hazard identification and risk analysis. This also means monitoring corrective actions and evaluating their results. Part of this role is to maintain records and safety documentation and to provide periodic reports on the organization's safety performance. To make sure that the organization improves, the safety manager must plan and facilitate staff and management safety training so they improve safety performance. For instance, by better reporting safety issues, following rules and procedures and so forth. The most important function is to coordinate internally with staff and management and externally with the authorities and safety organizations. The safety manager is a point of contact for everybody in the organization and he monitors safety concerns from staff and managers. His function is to give feedback to the organization so that everybody gets a better systemic view of the safety health of the organization. Implementing an SMS is a long process. Like any project, it needs a good plan which is adapted to the realities of the organization. It can take several years before the elements of the SMS start to really perform well. Mostly this is because of the fact that it takes time to convince people of this new way of working. Once the SMS is able to show results, it will start to generate more enthusiasm. A big part which is sometimes forgotten in an SMS is emergency response planning. It seems a bit contradictory. Aren't we trying to prevent an accident with SMS? The emergency response plan is there to ensure that if a major crisis happens, the organization is ready to respond effectively. A crisis can be anything, ranging from airport closure, big weather emergencies, an accident of a carrier in the same alliance, with your passengers on board. Even your aircraft could have an accident. Remember, it's always possible. Zero accidents are impossible to guarantee. The emergency response plan is important first for operational safety. In the confusion of the first crisis or accident, a second one can happen. Second of all, 
it is very important to competently respond to the situations so the passenger and authorities have confidence in the competence of your organization. A chaotic and confused response to an emergency can damage our reputation even more than the original emergency situation. The emergency plan should coordinate with other organizations, define roles and responsibilities of your staff, and plan an orderly transition to emergency operations. Finally, it's really important that everything about our safety management is documented. This is important not just for audit purposes, as the organization grows and changes, new people come on board and it is important that they are fully and accurately informed about our SMS. Our documentation is typically contained in the SMS manual and should clearly document safety policies and objectives, the SMS requirements, SMS processes and procedures, accountabilities and authorities and the SMS outputs. The second pillar of our SMS is actually the most important activity. Since we will discuss this in depth in our advanced SMS course, this online course will not dedicate much time to it. The safety risk management activity helps us answer the question what will cause our next accident or incident and how do we know about our risks. The hazard identification and risk assessment processes help us to gather safety data and convert it into useful safety intelligence which helps us to make risk-based decisions. The output of these activities are safety recommendations, which tell us how to reduce safety risk. After safety risk management, we need to answer the question, how do we know our risk controls still work? The safety assurance process measures if the SMS is operating according to our expectations and requirements continuously monitors the various internal processes as well as, as the operating environment to, de to detect any changes or deviations that may introduce emergence, emerging safety risks or the degradation of existing risk controls. Such changes or deviations may then be addressed together with the safety risk management process. The safety assurance process complements that of quality assurance with each having requirements for analysis, documentation, auditing and management reviews to assure that certain performance criteria are met. While quality assurance typically focuses on the organization's compliance with regulatory requirements, safety assurance specifically monitors the effectiveness of safety risk controls. The comp complementary relationship between safety assurance and quality assurance allows for an integration of certain supporting processes. Such integration can serve to achieve synergies to assure that the service provider's safety, quality and commercial objectives are met. Safety assurance activities should include the development and implementation of corrective actions in response to findings of systemic deficiencies which have a potential safety impact. Organizational responsibility for the development and implementation of corrective actions should reside with the departments cited in the findings. The level of safety that the organization seeks to achieve should be defined in a way that allows us to answer the question, how do we know our risk controls still work? Our safety objectives, our safety objectives are overall safety principles which should be mentioned in our safety policy. There should be a set of underlying specific and measurable safety targets. These would cover relevant aspects of the organization's vision, senior management commitments and realistic safety milestones and desired outcomes. The safety performance targets serve to measure how well our objectives are being met and should tell us more about the level of risk in specific areas of our operation. Then safety performance indicators are generally data that help us to measure the various dimensions of the safety target. Ideally they should measure the performance of our risk controls. It is very tricky to set targets and objectives in an effective way. What can easily happen is that organizations just measure what is easy to measure, like the number of safety reports and things like that, which don't really reflect the re level of safety performance in the operation. There are many sources we can use to feed the safety management process, such as safety surveys, observations, audits, investigations and so forth. The statistics from safety reports might also indicate performance, but we have to be careful that we measure the right things. 
the absolute number of reports doesn't tell us much. The absolute number of reports doesn't tell us much. We have to make sure these numbers are analyzed correctly. What we hope to achieve with the measurement of our safety performance is to give a systemic view of safety in our organization, especially a quick indication of underperformance so that management can implement corrective actions urgently. The management of change. It is mandatory to have a formal process to identify major operational changes which may affect the level of safety risk. Such changes might be the introduction of new destinations, equipment or aircraft types, a lot of new staff coming on board or many changes in the management team and so on. As a part of a complete risk assessment we need to study these changes before they happen and define if extra or stronger risk controls are needed. This might include better training practices, documentation or closer safety monitoring to identify risk quickly. The aim is to continuously improve our safety performance by constantly learning and applying how we can improve our safety operations. Not only is this good for safety, it will help to improve our overall operations, so that in case of expansion we are sure that our organization can safely handle the extra pressure of more aircraft, destinations and personnel. Efficient continuous improvement is measured through the monitoring of an organization's safety performance indicators and is related to the maturity and effectiveness of an SMS. An organization safety effort cannot succeed solely by telling or forcing people to follow policies. Safety promotion helps to improve both individual and organizational behavior by explaining how the rules and procedures are intended to keep everyone safe. To create a positive safety culture we need to show the people in our organization the benefits of the SMS. Positive safety culture improves the safety performance at several levels. But by showing people in the organization that safety reports are treated with respect and people who report it are not getting in trouble, we help to generate a stronger just culture. The more comfortable our people are about the just culture, the more they will report about safety issues. More reports mean more opportunities to learn about and improve our operations, which will improve our safety performance. The more feedback we give to our staff, the more they will understand why it is important to follow rules and procedures, so we guarantee we control our risks. We have to develop and maintain a safety training program that ensures our staff and management are trained according to their role in the SMS. That's what you're doing right now. Formal classroom training might be necessary in some cases, or short briefings about specific issues helps people to increase their safety competence and to contribute to a more effective system. It also explains staff the importance of safety reporting and specifically what they should report. Finally, it helps to explain what the organization learned about the specific safety issues and how they will be solved to reduce the level of risk. This is important feedback which helps the staff to stay motivated. Safety communication is another way to inform people in the organization what we learned about safety issues and specifically what the organization is doing to reduce risk. It makes the people aware of the safety management system, it communicates safety critical information and explains why particular safety actions are taken. It explains why safety procedures are introduced or changed or maybe why they're not changed despite safety reports. The way this communication can happen depends on what works in your organization. It might be achieved with a newsletter, email, bulletins or message board. There are many ways. Usually a mix of mediums is required. It is important that staff and management hear about the company's safety efforts because it boosts credibility and motivation and people are more likely to contribute. So basically, safety management is not that difficult as an activity. As we saw in the previous section, there is a whole infrastructure that is necessary to answer, to answer our four core safety performance questions. What is most likely going to cause your next accident or incident? How do you know about your risks? What are you doing about these risks? Are your risk controls still working? Throughout our advanced SMS course, we will come back to all of these four questions and go I look forward to seeing you in the classroom.